All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. Hey, you guys on the line, I've got James Carden. He's always writing such great stuff for the American Conservative and for Quincy and, of course, Acura. That's his group, um, the American Committee on East-West Accord, which, of course, is great on Russia issues especially. And I uh, wonder, how are you, James? doing all right how about yourself i'm okay man i appreciate you joining me today i want to talk with you about conferences which sounds kind of boring but not really in this case because one of them is the nato conference and the other is the national conservative conference grumble grumble fred flintstone under my breath cursing noises um but so uh first of all let's talk about uh nato because, uh, as you note, they've had a giant conference about how important they are and how much we need them and how much more power they should have and more expanding they should do. And uh, so I wonder, did anybody laugh or everybody just kept a straight face while they just pretended everything is going fine just as they'd planned? Or what's the deal? Well, it's what they seem to specialize in. There's no looking back. There's no kind of... They don't interrogate their own record or their motives or anything like that. So they had a very big summit meeting in Washington to mark the 75th anniversary of the alliance uh, in Washington. Recently, it shut down half the city. And um, basically, what came out of it was that um, the alliance said that Ukraine, uh, they would provide Ukraine a quote unquote bridge to NATO. So basically, they're doubling down on uh, their insistence that Ukraine uh, join the alliance. Um, and this has been a project in the works <clears throat> for some time, uh, beginning um, in 2008 at the Bucharest NATO summit, where the alliance pledged uh, that both Ukraine and Georgia shall become members of the alliance. So um, they have not really taken the hint provided by the Russians that this is a very bad idea uh, and they're, they're full steam ahead, uh, which um, is unfortunate because um, the terms that Putin recently laid out to end the war, um, you know, he said that um, as soon as Ukrainian neutrality is put on the table, they'll an act of ceasefire and begin negotiations. So this is NATO's message to the Russians that they're not interested. And so the war, um, unfortunately, will continue. You know, they always call it calculus. Oh, well, we're talking about our calculus. It's just basic arithmetic. If they're determined to bring what's left of Ukraine into NATO, then all they're telling Putin is you better not stop the war. You're going to have to take over the whole country. And then we'll see you at the Romanian and Polish border. Yeah, it seems like. Um, or they envision, they or they're operating under the illusion that they can win, that they can expel the Russians from the territory uh, that they've gained, uh, or they will accept uh, they will accept Ukraine um, as a rump state. Uh, in the alliance. Um, Ukraine in NATO in any form is going to be unacceptable to the Russians. Um, so, I, I uh, you know, so the war is going to continue until um, either, you know, uh, Ukraine in the West expel the Russians from Ukraine, which is probably not going to happen, um, or until uh, we finally get the message and accept Ukrainian neutrality. All right. Now, but here's the thing, though. But Biden himself, who 
you know, he's not just a figurehead and whatever. Like, this has been his policy since the 1990s. This is his favorite kind of pet project. He's basically, you know, him and John McCain are kind of the evil twins of all this stuff in the Senate. And he has said repeatedly, we're not bringing Ukraine into NATO. We can't. First of all, there ain't no way in the world we're going to fight a nuclear war over Ukraine. Now, the rest of NATO, sure. But Ukraine, hell no. If we were, we'd give them a war guarantee right now. We'd bring them into NATO right now. We can't do that, which is all the proof that we need right there. We got no intention of doing so. Even Joe Biden has no intention. If he stayed the president another 12 years, he has no intention of doing so. And then, as he puts it, well, you know, they got major reforms on corruption and on democracy. In other words, they'd have to entirely remake their political and economic system from total kleptocracy and oligarchy to something like a democratic republic with a capitalist economy, which they do not have and cannot do and will not do. And then he, on for good measure, says, and of course, you'd also have to have unanimous agreement inside NATO, which is also never going to happen. So... Anyway, we're just fighting this war for the principle that you can't tell us we're not bringing them in. But we're not bringing them in. And he said that over and over, and I actually believe him on that. I don't think they can bring Ukraine in for all those reasons and more. But especially the one about we're not going to fight Russia over freaking Kiev. They pretend to care about the fate of Ukraine. But when it comes to demonstrating their commitment, look at what's actually happening. They're not doing jack shit for them. Right. So it seems, given all that, even more pointless. And so it's just more pointless death and destruction. And the Ukrainian people are the ones ultimately who are uh, suffering. Uh, and um, it doesn't seem like there will be a real change of policy if Harris becomes uh president. And I think Trump is uh, something of a, a wild card in that regard as well. Yeah, I agree there. I mean, the only silver lining with Trump is he's so bad on China. He just wants to shift the focus away, him and his whole crew of kooks there, which we're going to talk more about the kooks in a second. But, um, And Harris, I mean, we all heard the famous clip of her explanation of what's going on over there. That, well, Russia and Ukraine are these countries over there and one attacked the other one. And I remember when I first saw that clip or heard that clip, I thought, well, she must have been talking to some little kids. And they just <laughs> took it out of context, you know? And it's like, no, she's on the morning show on the radio in Chicago. Like, okay. And then it's pretty clear when you listen to it carefully, or I forget if there's video of it. But essentially, this was the briefing that she got. And she's just repeating it. Russia is a big country, and it attacked a little country. And this is a person, so I don't know. I don't think she has a prayer anyway, unless Trump has a heart attack or something. Or something, I, you know. That the last, Yeah, I think that the last two days, three days, have been very uh, kind to her. Um, I don't expect that. I don't, don't expect this honeymoon to continue. I think that the Democrats are... Um, kind of whistling past the graveyard. Uh, I, I, I don't think that she is the solution to their to their problem. No, definitely not. I mean, that was the joke all along. Was this guy's way too old to do it? Anyone can tell you that. You don't have to know about politics at all. You could just be anybody's little old auntie and go, man, this guy is too old to be the president. But then their bench is like the Libertarian Party's bench. There's nobody on it. <laughs> <There's>, <laughs> what are they going to do? They're screwed. They got Kalama Harris. They got old, um, you know, fentanyl crisis out there from California. Um, they got Gretchen Whitmer, you know, the nurse ratchet of the lockdowns. You know, I mean, there's just no way they've got nothing. And, um, you know, I tried to watch her thing yesterday. I'm like, they're like, OK, watch Kamala Harris's 17 minute speech. And I'm like, all right, bet. You know what? This is history. She's running. I got to know something about this. I got to watch. So like, all right, I'll do it. I'll watch it on speed and a half. And, and I'll, nah, I watched like, I just skipped around, watched like, I don't know, two and a half, three minutes of it or something. That was all I needed. I mean, what can you say, dude? She's just she such a phony. Her yep. voice is terrible. Her cadence is terrible. Her smile is fake. And 
she's just not believable at all. And I guess I shouldn't project my own impression onto like what everybody else must think, but they also all must think that too. And she ain't no Barack Obama, man. You know, as far as like something for people to believe in, what is there to believe in? Nothing. I mean, not, not even close. And she has this strange, you know, it's kind of unfair. I guess people can't help it. I certainly don't like the sound of my own voice, but the, she has this way of this accent, which is sort of mysterious. It's like when Hillary Clinton tries to speak Southern, you know, she has that sort yeah. of, it's very odd and it's very off putting. Um, and I don't think the fact that, you know, just because Biden stepped down, this makes her a different political animal. Um, so, and I don't think that the VP ultimately matters anyway. I, and the people who seem to be in, in the running for the position um, don't inspire a lot of confidence. I mean, she can't possibly pick Josh Shapiro because – you know, with his close ties to the Israel lobby, the progressives are going to sit home. Um, Mark Kelly seems seems to be um, the only one with any sort of uh, possible appeal. Yeah, they keep talking about him because he was an astronaut. Doesn't and all need that, his right? name is it Mark Kelly? <laughs> yeah, I think so. I mean, that's the whole thing is they're up against the most famous man in world history. So, like, that's pretty tough. <laughs> Yeah. You know, what are you going to do? I still think it's going to be close. And, you know, he is, you know, a villainous anti-hero to a lot of people, but that's good enough for a lot of people. I don't know if you ever read that thing Taibi wrote. I think it was in Hate, Inc., where he has this whole thing about pro wrestling and Donald Trump playing the heel. And the thing <laughs> is, though, is the bad guy can be the dominant figure in wrestling for a while against the good guys if it's played right. You know, and as long as there's no, like, truly sympathetic good guy that he's beating up on, he's basically beating up on all a bunch of wimps who deserve it, people cheer for that. And I think that's the dynamic here again, big time, you know? It might well be. Yeah. Um, anyway, uh, what's funny, though, is the way with a blink of an eye, and I don't know if the Republicans really had thought this through or what, but they just completely gave away the age issue to the other side. Now mm -hmm. who's old and somewhat senile and confuses Nikki Haley for Nancy Pelosi and these kinds of errors, you know what I mean? Um, and, and they keep demanding that Biden step down, like really, and make her the president for the next few months before you run against her? Are you crazy? But they are crazy. Yep. They're re re Republicans. They're completely stupid. Which is actually I, I, brings I, us to our next subject, the National Conservative Conference. That this is the intellectual brain power behind the Trumpian movement, as um, I'll paraphrase it politely. Um, uh, uh, Arthur Bloom wrote that Trump is just the Israel lobby and Buchanan face. And this... <laughs> This National <laughs> Conservatism Conference is an Israeli plot. It has nothing to do with American patriotism or nationalism at all. It's a bunch of goddamn Likud settlers telling the American conservatives what they're supposed to think and believe. Oh, we've made a real break from the George W. Bush years when everybody was believing Abram Shulsky's lies from the Office of Special Plans. Now we're going to do it Trump's way, which is also... The Office of Special Plans, also whatever Likud wants. It's completely crazy. It's like uh, the Tom Woods Law. No matter who you vote for, you always get John McCain. Yeah, it's interesting. That this this movement, um, which has a lot of money and a lot of names behind it, and it just kind of sprung up out of nowhere over the past couple of years. Um. I believe that it's a lot of um, Peter Thiel money and, 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 and stuff like that. And it's a lot of um, different kind of Twitter personalities and um, they're trying to, I think, launder neoconservative ideas through a different sort of um, brand. Mm -hmm. And not all of it is 
in my in my way of thinking all that objectionable it seems like it's um they're kind of post liberals in a way and so post liberalism is another kind of recent um political movement that is against kind of neoliberal economics at home and neoconservative uh, foreign policy um, abroad. But when they, when NatCons begin to speak about foreign policy, there's the unmistakable ring of Paul Wolfowitz in that crowd. Um, and I think what makes them dangerous is um, that they've been pretty successful in rebranding these neoconservative ideas. Um, and they have a lot of support within the Trump camp. So if Trump, you know, ends up winning, um, you're going to see a lot of these, um, a lot of these people um, in office. And, and there's um, quite a bit of overlap with their ideas and the ideas of, of Robert O'Brien. And O'Brien was Trump's national security advisor. And now he um, seems poised to uh, be taking on a big role, a big job, uh, should Trump become president. And he laid out his ideas um, in a, you know, very much discussed foreign affairs essay not too long ago. Um, the gist of it is basically where they differ with the traditional neocons is like they will kind of talk a good game with regard to NATO expansion and kind of indicate that caution might be a good policy uh, in terms of, you know, um, antagonizing the Russians. But everywhere else, it's very much a neoconservative program with regard to Israel-Palestine, with regard to Iran, and then, of course, with regard to China, who they they want to elevate China into the next, you know, Soviet Union and wage and a, so a Cold War era style campaign um, against against China. Yeah. Um, so this seems to me to be, you know, a really bad idea. And basically, it's not at all different from um, the foreign policy on offer by the Democrats. So right. you know, what's the point? And as you say, um, as you you know just said. Um, you know, this is really an Israeli-American um, project. Um, not, not at all, you know, different uh, in its um, policies from, uh, you know, neoconservatism. Hey, y'all, let me tell you about Robertson Roberts Brokerage, Inc. Nobody trusts the U.S. dollar anymore. Foreign governments are stocking up on gold instead of $100 bills. One, they know they need to. And two, that means you need to, too. Interest rates are up, but for some reason, not much for savings accounts. Park your money there and watch Uncle Joe Biden just counterfeit its value away. You can see how the Fed is afraid to raise rates to beat inflation for fear of popping the current bubbles, at least before the election. So more inflation it will continue to be. Gold is your shield against monetary and price inflation, just like it always has been. Now Tim Fry and the guys over at Roberts & Roberts are recommending gold over silver since the world's almost 200 governments are putting their own pressure on the price, which should help everyone else who makes similar calls on their own. Of course, Roberts and Roberts can help you with platinum, palladium, and silver, as well as gold. Don't let the Fed and the war party inflate all your savings away. Look up Roberts and Roberts at rrbi.co. That's rrbi.co. Hey, y'all, you should sign up for my Substack. It's scotthortonshow.substack.com. And if you do that, you'll get the interviews a day before everybody else. But not only that, they'll be free of commercials. How do you like that? Pretty good, huh? ScottHortonShow.substack.com Hey, y'all. LibertasBella.com is where you get Scott Horton Show and Libertarian Institute shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, and stickers and things, including the great Top Lobsters designs as well. See, that way it says on your shirt why you're so smart. Libertas Bella. From the same great folks who bring you ammo.com for all your ammunition needs, too. That's LibertasBella.com. Hey, y'all got kids or nephews or anything? You know about the Tuttle Twins books, right? Libertarian lessons about life, liberty, truth, and the state. It's really great stuff. 
And hey, did you guys know I'm a Tuttle twin? Or, well, I'm a character in their world now. Skater Scott, local vert dog and anti-government know-it-all. They introduced me in a short book last year, and I hear they're going to develop my character's story a bit more in the future. Cool, right? Anyway, they're now celebrating 10 years and having sold millions of these books. And now they're giving away a free magazine at TuttleTwins.com slash 10 years. There's no shipping charge, and they're not going to ask for your credit card. It's just a free magazine. The gimmick is that inside the magazine, they've got a really great deal to get all the books. The best deal they've ever offered, which you'll certainly want to take them up on. So go to TuttleTwins.com slash 10 years for your free magazine. And someday, hopefully soon, you and your kids will be reading all about the libertarian antics of cartoon me, along with all my new pals. That's TuttleTwins.com slash 10 years. Yeah, and you can't believe them about Russia at all. That's just a sop to the right that doesn't believe in Biden's Russia policy right now. But Mm -hmm. there's no reason Mm -hmm. to think that they would really be any better on it. I mean, possibly they'd seek a compromise and an end of the war. But they're certainly not going to, for example, really lead a reintegration of Russia with Europe and the West and try to fix things. New Cold War is on and staying through whatever Trump years, unless somehow he and Putin can just hit off some grand deal or something. But I just don't think that's going to happen at all. I don't think he's going to have any support in his own government for it because he doesn't know where to find good America first conservatives to work for him. All he can do is just go to the Likud. So it's just going to be the same damn thing again. Well, he he really has publicly separated himself from that heritage project, which um, this is project 2025. Um, and he's publicly disassociated himself from that, which I thought was kind of a good thing since they seem to be very much on the NADCON level in terms of foreign yeah. policy. Um, I, I hadn't really been paying too close attention to the NADCONs until recently. And I went through the program of that conference and I was really alarmed by, uh, by what I saw. Um, has it been on your radar for, for a while? And well, you know, I got a great excuse, which is I got my nose in this history book I'm writing about uh, the new Cold War. That same one I asked you to endorse two years ago that I haven't finished yet. Um, but uh, <laughs> thanks, though. I'll, I'll probably send it to you again to see if you want to stand by that endorsement <laughs> now that it's different. Um, but uh, so, no, I'm behind on everything, man. That's why I'm interviewing you because you're doing such a great job on this. Um, keeping up with it. But I mean, I wanted to ask you because, you know, I said, oh, it's a big Israeli project, but um, it's not just because Peter Thiel is running it, although I'm going to interview Kelly later today about what a kook he is and his um, his ties to Israel and, and his recent ridiculous statements on that issue. But it's this guy that you wrote about, Yoram Hazoni. Who the hell is Hor- Yoram Hazoni? James? Well, he's basically a Israeli American academic along the lines of think of uh, you know Patrick Deneen if he was a, an Israeli something like that. Um, I believe he and Deneen actually went to graduate school together, if I'm not mistaken. Um, Hazoni was raised in the um, occupied territories, and he came to the United States um, as a teenager. His parents, I believe, were academics. Um, he was educated here and then he moved back to the occupied territories and raised his family there and, um, became active in far right wing Israeli politics and worked as a speech writer for, uh, the Israeli Supreme leader, Benjamin Netanyahu. And so, you know, his politics are, are, are that, that sort of thing, but he wrote a, book about nationalism a number of years ago that really won over a lot of American uh, converts. Um, The book in thumbnail form, and I would urge people to go to the um, Cato Institute website, has some really interesting stuff on, on, on this book that he wrote about nationalism. And um, basically he says that the nation state is mandated by the old Testament. So, you know, um, (laughs) that's sort of alarming, uh, for a number of reasons. Um, not least because, um, Israel is in its current predicament because they, 
insist on viewing the Old Testament uh, like we view Zillow or rent.com. It's it's not really a real estate directory. Um, it's supposed to be a, uh, you know, a religious tract. And even um, I know that in the book of Samuel, God says, man, you don't want that. What are you talking about? A king, you know, what he's going to do, he's going to conscript your son and take all your farm produce and all the thing, you know, I forgot what he, violate your daughter. And they go, no, nah, we're, we're sure God, <laughs> we, we know what we're doing. <laughs> So it's this really, you know, it's this real Israeli kind of project. And he set up this think tank called the Edmund Burke Foundation. Oh, how um, cute. I don't know what Edmund Burke has to do with the Old Testament. Um, but It just sounds this, better than uh, the Ariel Sharon Foundation, you know. Yeah, well, exactly. It's their masters at laundering their neoconservative, you know, ideology. Um and then this Edmund Burke Foundation launched this series of conferences, these NatCon um, conferences. And so they just had one in Washington recently. And actually, um, as it happens, not surprisingly, Kelly of Lejos at Quincy, you know, wrote a superb uh, report from it outlining, you know, their ideas with regard to Middle East and um, China policy. Um, so. You know, I just thought it was time to sort of, I mean, my co-author, the great uh, Colonel Douglas McGregor, and I thought it was time to um, kind of blow the whistle on this thing. And um, I don't, I hope people aren't fooled by it, but it seems like, um, it seems like there are many uh, people who, in this town, who really think that this is really something new, but it really isn't at all. Yeah. It's the same, it's the same old stuff. Um, and given, um, you know, let's face it, the criminal behavior of the Israeli regime um, over the, you know, past yep. uh, what would be nine months or so. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, it's incredibly alarming to me that. Yeah. Um, well, and it's the ignorance of Donald Trump, and I I maintain that he is still a Job like bet or practical joke between God and Lucifer that they're playing on the United States here. We need a rogue so bad. We need someone who can stop a Bush and a Clinton so badly. And, but he's the only guy who can do it. And he's a complete boob and he's a complete idiot. And he's never read anything before. He has no idea what America first even means. You know, David Sanger hung that around his neck trying to smear him as an anti-Semite back years ago. It just didn't stick because Americans have never heard of the America First Committee or Charles Lindbergh before or whatever. So Sanger's plot failed and it just became a slogan. But it doesn't mean defend America first. It doesn't mean leave the world the hell alone. It just means be George W. Bush, only with slightly different branding. And then, of yeah. course, for the Israelis, they go, oh, Americans don't like compassionate, conservative, center-right W. Bushism, and they prefer this more kind of uh, roguish, Jacksonian take. We can work with that. I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll create a new foundation, and we'll create a new institute, and we'll hold a giant nationalism conference, and we'll just tell all these Trumpians, you can be America first as long as you stay Israel first. And they'll continue to obey because it says in their Schofield Bible that that's what Jesus wants. And they're not willing to think critically at all. It says right there in Romans 13, when a Republican is in power, you obey and you obey Israel and shut your mouth. And that's what Americans believe. American conservatives, the leader of American conservatism is Benjamin Netanyahu. And they are his lowly subjects. It's pathetic and ridiculous, but it is what it is. They can't think their way out of it, James. They just can't. Well, the other alarming um, aspect, as if you know, we needed more examples to point to, um, is something that Doug and I um, picked up on at the conference, was um, that there's also a movement within the NatCon movement to basically gut the Bill of Rights. So, um, you know, the traditional First Amendment 
the establishment clause, which, um, you know, erects a wall between church and state, according to the NATCONs, that needs to go. We need to become a, a Judeo-Christian um, country officially. And they they believe the myth of the, of the founding fathers that they were like, you know, church going, you know, Bible banging Christians. They were nothing of the kind. Um and so that's another part of their project. One and of the, even if they were, the that's panelists. completely One beside the, the point anyway. Yeah, they're completely crazy. And their version <laughs> of Christianity is such heresy. It's so ridiculous, dude. They would have us follow John Hagee, the blasphemer, who doesn't even believe a single word that he says, who laughs at his congregation of fools and suckers and knaves. Well, I mean, it's, you know, one of the panelists... Uh, who's the editor of uh, the pretty religious right um, journal, First Things, um, you know, was urging the Roberts court to, quote unquote, tear down that wall, not the Berlin Wall, the wall between church and state. Um, I mean, these guys are out there saying this stuff, you know, um, proudly, publicly. Um, and it's it's quite frightening. I'm quite, you know, I'm sorry, but um, I'm an old fashioned American, I um, rather appreciate the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. I don't think that we should become an Israeli-style theocracy like these people. Uh, I think that this stuff is very, very troubling. Yeah, and when they say Judeo-Christian, what they mean is focus on the Old Testament that says that God says that Israel can do whatever they want, and forget the New Testament that says that actually those aren't the rules anymore. Forget your own religion in the name of a foreign power. A secular no, foreign power of actual no men rule. making horrible, sinful decisions. There's no golden rule in their biblical worldview. That, that gets edited out. It's completely sick, dude. It's completely it stupid it and, and embarrassing and shameful is what it is. You know, a bunch of atheists understand Christianity better than the people who claim to be members of the religion and then let themselves be completely bowled over by foreign powers who obviously are just laughing at them and ridiculing them. You know, like Irving Crystal said, hey, it's their theology. It's our Israel. In other words, sucker, you believe what you're told, fool. Yeah. Well, that's right. I mean, the other problem with it is that, you know, these people who, you know, the Natcons claim to be, you know, America first, all that stuff. But um, why are they looking to a foreign intellectual, a foreign intellectual tradition? Uh, you know, we we have quite a robust, you know, uh, foreign policy realist traditions on which we can draw on, um, and they ignore things like Washington's farewell address um, because. Washington warned against the influence of foreign intrigue. Well, they're all about they're about nothing else but foreign intrigue here. Right. So they ignore the warnings of Washington and the warnings of John Quincy Adams. Yep. Uh, they're, they just they're just astroturf. They're just astroturf is all they are, right? Completely they don't, they fake. Don't give a, a damn about the the United States, its traditions, um, at all. It, this is a foreign import, and we should be very very wary of it. Ah, man, I wish Justin was here. He'd be having so much fun with this if he wasn't falling for it in his senile old age. But anyway. All right. Thank you, James. This has been great. I really appreciate all your great writing. Thanks again, bud. Good talking to you. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A., APSradio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.